Good morning. Uh, I haven't met everybody. My name's Randy Barnhart. I'm the senior pastor here. We're just delighted uh, that you're with us today. And um, I want to start by asking you about a, a name from the past. Some of you, it, raise your hand if this name rings a bell. Captain Herb Emery. Anybody remember Captain Herb? Okay, yeah, a long time WSB radio, WSB TV uh, traffic reporter. Every morning, every afternoon, Captain Herb Emery uh, had millions of viewers and listeners and all that uh, as he helped uh, them, us, I guess, navigate uh, the Grady Curve, Spaghetti Junction, 400, I-20, uh, the rest of the region's demonic roadways. His, uh, his voice is so unfailingly chipper all the time. He guided frustrated commuters, uh, you know, through the, through the uh, traffic jams and, and uh, he could see, you know, when it was breaking up. He could see when it was not going to break up. And, and he would always say something like, uh, 400, man, stick a fork in it. It is done. You know, people would be, you'd see him diving off the road left and right trying to get. He kept his trained eagle eye on the highways of the greater Atlanta um, region, really, um, in this helicopter, what he called the, the best office in town. He could see the traffic jam. He could see when things were stopping. He could see when the way ahead they were starting to break up. You know, he had a completely different perspective on the traffic than any of us, anybody on the expressway. Um, he knew when you were going to be able to get home. He knew when you might as well just relax. You know, perspective makes all the difference. Can't tell how many times I was sitting in the car. You know, I'm going to be late because the traffic's a mess or whatever. And you know, we, with our limited points of view, we're at ground level. But if somehow we could get a perspective and look down upon the traffic jams, if you will, of our lives, um, I think we could react much differently. I think we would, we would respond a whole lot differently when your child is sick and uh, seriously sick, when your marriage is a struggle. <clears throat> You don't know how it's going to end. You have an illness, and you're just praying for some sort of a miracle. You, you can't shake financial worries, um, or you, you, you can't find a job, and you're looking, and it's just not going well, or, or you, you, know, you lose a spouse, and you're just you know, so sad from it. And, you know, your, your, your perspective really can make a difference. There's some of these things where you're going to be sad. It's going to be hard, and there's no escaping that, perspective or not. But it can help you get to a better, healthier place. Today we're going to look at John 11, the story many of you know. I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but I'm going to hit some highlights and share, uh, share the story with you. And, and I won't even be able to go into, you know, we could spend all day Jesus talking about the resurrection, you know, uh, but we're not going to do that. We'll do that another day. But just hit this story. Uh, there's one particular part of it that I want to focus in on. I'm not sure we focus in on it that much. It's a story about a man named Lazarus uh, who grew to be really sick. He and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, Mary, really close friends with Jesus. He stayed in their home. It was a place where he was comfortable, and, and now uh, while Jesus is out of town, Lazarus is, is seriously ill. Now, when Jesus is your, your friend and you run into difficulty, what are you going to do? Well, they did the same thing you would do. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Uh, it's an emergency. I mean, so this is an emergency. Lazarus is gravely ill. It appears that they, they thought he could die at any time. They sinned for Jesus. He, he's seriously sick. And notice what, what is said here. The sisters sent word to Jesus, the one you love is sick. What do they, what do they not say? There's no invitation. Come to our house. There's no request. They didn't say, Jesus, please come quickly. We're, we're in trouble. Listen, look at the way they viewed Jesus. They just assumed that it, when Jesus heard that something bad was happening in their lives, he would hurry there. They knew Jesus. They knew that he loved them. 
Uh, they, they knew, and that's all they said. He's sick, the one, you know, your friend, the one you love, he's sick. The word they use here is the word for friendship, by the way. The word they use for love, it's, it's friendship. Your good friend whom you love is sick. Of course Jesus would come. It never crossed their minds that Jesus wouldn't come. I mean, never thought that. But Jesus, uh, in answer to this bit of news in verse 4, gives us a hint of what's going to happen. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. I want you to see something here real quickly. When we're in trouble, when we have an illness or disaster in our lives, uh, we need to remember this perspective. Jesus had the perspective in the story that we need. God has a plan. God has a purpose. This is for God's glory. In other words, death would not be the ultimate end of, of Lazarus' story. Something amazing is going to happen here, and it's going to bring God glory. What follows is so instructive, so helpful to us. I think it is so strengthening um, for anybody and everybody who suffers and uh, suffers through God's responses. Because let's just face it, we do. We, we sometimes have to suffer through God's response. Sometimes if you feel like your prayers and your frustrations and your fears have fallen on, on deaf ears, uh, we need this perspective. So verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Let that sink in. He loved them. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Is that the way you would expect this story to go? I mean, these two verses really are the heart of this story. I mean, I think this is what God wants us to hear right now. The, the word translated love here, by the way, is a different word than the one they used. They sent word, the one you love, he's sick. Uh, and here John says, Jesus loved Martha, Mary, Lazarus. It's a different word. This is agape. This is that unstoppable love, that highest type of love. It's the love of God, that love that that seeks not your immediate comfort, not your immediate happiness, but always your highest good. He's saying God loves us with that kind of a love. Jesus loved the sisters and loved Lazarus in that way. But when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Does that make sense to anybody here? I mean, really. It does not say, uh, but... Uh, there at verse 6, but when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed. As in, this doesn't make sense, but he stayed. It says, so. As in, therefore, because he loved him, loved them, he stayed uh, two more days where he was. I mean, two more days. The disciples are, are wondering, where, where is he? I mean, or, well, why is he not going immediately? Because uh, his friend's sick. Why are we staying you know, I guarantee you, uh, uh, Mary and Martha were wondering the same thing. And I know that some of you are wondering that too in your lives. Why? Why, why have you not come? You know, why, why have you not shown up when I need you? You cry out to God and it seems like God doesn't hear. And you wonder why God is taking so long. Doesn't he care for me? You know, you might expect the storyline to go. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he said to his disciples, find a horse, I have to ride, I have to get there as quickly as possible. That's not what happens. He doesn't do that. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus so much, he didn't show up. He didn't even leave to go see them for two days. It's almost absurd. Maybe it sounds that to you. I mean, from down where we are, from our human point of view, it looks like, I mean, he doesn't care anymore. Anybody ever felt that? Where are you, God? I'm crying out. Why are you, why are you not showing up? Maybe, maybe you're right there, right now in your life. You're wondering. You're in that, you know, two more days stage where he's staying two more days and you need him right now. You know, Jesus stayed and stayed and before going to rescue his friend. Two more days. Jesus hadn't come. Two more days in your life. Two more days of, of uh, frustrating uh, financial situation. Two more days of sickness. Two more days of 
of anxiety in your heart. I mean, two more days, God, are you going to show up? Two more days, you've done everything right, diet, exercise, supplements, and you get the word from your doctor that your health is failing. There's just not much they can do. I mean, from down here, it is impossible to see what's coming. But John 11, if we'll listen, if we'll draw close, if we'll trust in the author, we're going to get a new perspective. What we're going to see is this, a delayed answer is not a denied request. A delayed answer is not a denied request. Can y'all read that out loud with me? A delayed answer is not a denied request. I mean, they look the same. They sure enough feel the same. I'm telling you, if you get too close, they smell the same. And it's not that good. But it's the truth of the matter is, a delayed answer is not a denied request. Now, God may well deny my request, and he has plenty of times. You have no understanding of the stupid things I've prayed for in my life. Looking back, I'm thinking, oh, Lord, thank you so much for not giving me that. I mean, I have been so stupid. I probably shouldn't say this behind the pulpit. I need to come out from it. I have been so stupid at times in my life when there were people treating me unfairly. When I prayed for justice, I'm lucky I didn't become a charcoal briquette just like that. If he gave me justice, that is exactly what I would have been. I mean, God may well deny your requests. I'm not saying that he won't. I mean, he's still God and you're still not, right? But from our limited point of view, we, we, can, we can't see what God's going to do next. We can't begin to understand why we don't get any of that sort of stuff. We don't know what to ask for. We sometimes don't even know why we need to ask for it. I mean, we certainly don't know what's best. A whole lot of times, we are not flying up, at the, up in the chopper, looking down on the terrible traffic. All we can see are the delays. And we can see the exhaust fumes, and we're starting to taste them. We don't like it. We see the other drivers frustrated and honking their horns and worried glances at their watches. But John, who relays this account, wants us to see the, the inexplicable Delays are delays that are born in the love of God. It said he loved them, so he stayed two more days. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to immediately make sense or maybe ever make sense, but there's a lesson here to be learned. Uh, I assure you, um, Jesus loved, that's God's love, that always seeks your highest good. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Uh, so when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed away two more days. So, not but. It was the reason, love was the reason he stayed away. It wasn't the lack of love. It was the reason. Now, that's, that's hard, but there's, there, the lesson's coming. When we're being torn apart, it is so tough to believe that God really loves us, that love still has my name. You know, that's the title of this series, right? Love has a name. He's still got your name. He knows you. He knows the struggles in your life, and he's still got your name. It feels like it's been forever. Two days. Let's try two years. How about a couple of decades? He's still got your name. I mean, we need perspective. We need to be above it all. This is the perspective that John 11 gives us. Love has my name. I, I still live in God's heart. He loves me. John 11 is teaching us here. Can't talk about that word so <laughs> too much. John's teaching us here what looks to us like God's delays, like we think of delays as just being late, right? Um, these are the plan. I mean, this is rooted in God's love. This is a part of God's purpose. God's all-powerful, and he can do anything. He knows everything. He knows when a sparrow falls to the ground. He knows our plight. He knows our cares. But we earthbound human beings um, can come to the same perspective in the middle of a crisis if we'll listen to Jesus and look at what he's doing right here. This side of heaven, we're never going to fully understand how God runs the world and why he runs the world the way he does. When help takes too long from our perspective, and there's no reason, I mean, there's nothing wrong with complaining about it. Um, he, he can handle the prayers. We should. 
But when help takes too long from our perspective, we want to find his perspective. It's okay to complain. But at the same time, we ought to God, say, God, help me to see this from heaven's point of view. You know, when, you, when you've lost a spouse or a child or your job, your career, whatever it is, um, you're going to need, to, you're gonna need a, a different point of view. You're going to have to have a higher perspective. Um, if we spent all our time asking just why, uh, we wouldn't be using our time very well. But there is a general principle here, I think. Christ delayed coming to Lazarus in order to strengthen the love and faith of those who had to wait. I think the same thing holds true sometimes when God says no. It's for our good. Say, so, yeah, but I needed this healing. I needed somebody to be restored. I needed this. I needed that. You don't, you don't have his point of view. I don't have his point of view. I would love to claim that I do. I would love to have it. But someday we will, but not yet. But for two days, Jesus kind of calmly goes about his, his work, you know, uh, away from his close friends that he loves. They're in anguish. And he, he's, you know, maybe they went out every hour to look down the street, see if Jesus was coming, or to ask people, have you heard anything? Anybody seen Jesus, you know? Um, then they go back into Lazarus, and his life is ebbing away, and, you know, after two days, Jesus decides it's time to go to see them. He says to his disciples, let's go, let's go back to Judea. Let's go, let's go to where uh, Lazarus is. The disciples go, you know, um, we were just wondering why you weren't going. We weren't really all that eager to go. You remember there are people there that want to kill us, right? You remember there are people there that would like to, you know, we got enemies there, Jesus, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't go. And um, it was about that time that Jesus told them, you know, Lazarus has died. First, he said it in a really veiled way. You know, they didn't understand it. He said he's fallen asleep, and they're kind of confused. So he says it directly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus and his friends make the journey to where um, Mary, uh, Martha, and Lazarus had lived, and he asked them, um, asked the people there, where'd you bury him? Show me his tomb. Take me to his tomb. And they said, well, it's, it's right over there. Come with us. You know, it's right over there. And that's when the Bible records that Jesus cried. He cried. I mean, this is it tears streaming down the face of the son of God his heart was broken for them broken for the people uh, frustrated maybe with the unbelief and um, and the people standing around said look how much he loved him look how, look how much he loved him you have a great savior who knows your name he has your name and he loves you. And it's unfailing. Uh, you know, from your perspective and mine, he delays and he stays away. And he allows us to go through the toughest of times. But then when he comes, he enters into our sorrow. He weeps. We don't have a God who hovers above our feelings and our struggles. We have a God who enters into the sorrow. That's the perspective that Jesus wants us to have. If you're hurting, he weeps with you. If your heart is broken, his heart is broken with yours. Um, you know, there were others who saw Jesus weeping. And, um, you know, they were, some of them said, look how much he loved him. These are the ones who said, well, it would have been nice if he had come when they called. Yeah, that would have been nice. Uh, looks like he didn't even try to come. Actually, they said something like, well, couldn't he have healed Lazarus the way he healed the blind man? That's basically what they're saying. But nice if he'd have done something. And it's great that he's here and crying and all. It took him a while to get here. Jesus arrives at the tomb. You know, it's a cave. That's what it usually was, carved out of a hillside. And uh, there, apparently that's what it was here. There was a stone, large stone at the mouth of it. And Jesus tells him, move the stone. Uh, Martha says, Lord, you know, it's been four days. You know, four days uh, 
it's not going to be pleasant. You know, the odor, is, you know, it's not going to be nice. And Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Listen, did I not tell you? Has he not told you all your life that if you will trust in him, you will see? The, has he not repeatedly shown you that if you will lean on him and trust in him, you will see the glory of God? Friends, if, if you believe, and I mean trust, place your life in his hands, uh, he's going to come through with you, for you on his schedule according to his purposes, but you will see God's glory. I get it. You are stuck in two days of delay. Or maybe you're thinking, two days, listen, all hope is lost because my life's been dead for four days. I mean, your relationship's been broken too long. Your habits are too ingrained. You think you're never going to change. It's been four days. I'm dead and smelly. This is not the time to give up hope. It's the time to lean more heavily on him who is our hope. Here's the difference. You and I, in the story, we look at the characters. And we look at the circumstances. And Jesus is saying, I want you to look at the author. And I want you to see his hand involved in the movements of everything. Verse 43, back into the story, says, When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. I skipped something. I want to stop before we read the rest of this, okay? Right before this, Jesus prays. He prays. Uh, he thanks his father for hearing him. That's his perspective. Remember? He's, he's, uh, we're looking at all the things going on, and the woe is me, and Jesus has got his eyes on heaven. Man, that's what you need to do. Eyes on heaven. Don't worry about the wind and the waves. Keep your eyes where they need to be. Then verse 43, when he had said this, prayed to his God, thanking him, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He wanted everybody there to know. Love hasn't forgotten the name of his dear friend Lazarus. Love has a name. And at that moment, they all heard the name called out. Lazarus, come out. He is calling your name. He is calling your name. He knows you. And he cares about you. And if you hear him calling your name, don't, don't ignore it. Don't, don't, don't shut the door when you hear him call your name. Now picture this scene. He's been dead for days. They're still in mourning according to custom. Um, Jesus says, roll the stone away. And they do. They roll the stone away. They could see Lazarus' body. Eager crowd leaning forward, you know. Suddenly they get real quiet. Sisters uh, stop weeping. Everybody's got this sense of excitement and expectation. I think I see something moving in there. And then verse 44, the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of, li of linen. A delayed answer is not the same thing as a denied request. I know you have been filled with grief and fear and loss. You've had two days of waiting and more, four days of death and more. You are tired and discouraged, but God still has your name. Love has a name, and it is still yours. It's your name that he has. Perspective is absolutely everything. You know, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we all know that our sorrow is ultimately going to turn into a joy uh, in the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21 promises he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. What a magnificent future uh, we have. What a, what a magnificent future. You're thinking, future's good. What about right now? I'm hurting right now. Well, we get to choose our perspective. We can curse the traffic, stand on the bumpers, look, trying to see what's going on, honk the horn some more, 
like that's going to move the 17,000 cars in front of you, you know, or we can choose to believe Jesus in John 11 and be elevated above all of it. See that help is on the way, that God is in control, that his delays are in fact delays of love, and that a delayed answer is not the same thing as a denied request. Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness, your goodness. You are kind and true. And Father, we don't understand the way you run things, and sometimes, quite frankly, we don't like it. But we love you, and we trust you. Help us, Father, to believe in our unbelief. Give us strength beyond our own. Lift us up to a perspective beyond anything we can get from human wisdom. And Father, help us to trust in you always. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.